On behalf of Dean Stam, it is my privilege and uh, personal delight to be able to introduce our distinguished guest, John Negroponte. Uh, welcome also to our faculty colleagues from across grounds and friends from the International Relations Organization, co-sponsors of this talk. Uh, I first met the ambassador more than 30 years ago under what I will call unusual bipartisan circumstances. <laughs> so I will honor his request that I be brief in recounting his remarkable service. Let me put it really simply. Name almost any difficult job in Washington and some of the most challenging posts overseas. And chances are John Negroponte has been asked to serve as our nation's representative and diplomat on the front lines. Iraq, Mexico, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Honduras. And he's been asked by Republicans and Democrats in the Oval Office, liberals and conservatives alike, if he would serve just one more post. Get me Negro Ponte, they have been saying, from Carter to Reagan to Clinton to Bush. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Deputy National Security Advisor. He ran the State Department as Deputy Secretary, and he served as our nation's very first Director of National Intelligence, overseeing the work of NSA, DIA, CIA, and others in the intelligence community during time of war. Now, as our colleague, former Assistant Secretary Jeff Bergner, my friend who's here with us today, can attest, when you work in Washington with senior government officials, word gets around very quickly who the really good men and women are, the good guys to work with, the good guys to work for, the straight-talking leaders, those who speak truth to power, who challenge conventional wisdom, whose candid judgment is offered, and whose head is not swelled by authority and whose patriotism and clear definition of the national interest has not flagged in the face of tough challenges. Ambassador John Negroponte, throughout his remarkable career in public service, has been just such a man. So it should come as no surprise to you students that he now focuses much of his time each week at Yale, either in the classroom teaching or one-on-one -on -one with students in office hours. He is still trying to make the world a better place, one graduate at a time. We are honored to have him here today, and we thank him for his extraordinary record of leadership and national service. Please join me in welcoming to this classroom in the Frank Batten School, Ambassador John Negroponte. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to say about Jerry. First of all, he mentions that we first met about 30 years ago. That's when he worked for Senator Alan Cranston, I believe, uh, senator from California. And I was awaiting uh, confirmation, I believe, to be ambassador to Mexico, but I can't quite uh, remember for sure, uh, and uh, it got hung up a little and delayed uh, by various uh, matters that had come up, but uh, that, in retrospect, has, was sort of standard fare uh, with respect to these nominations. I ended up being confirmed nine different times by the United States Senate, and uh, that in itself is a whole story that you don't really want to hear about uh, today, but it's uh, quite a process. Um, and becoming a bit more complex as time goes on, it would appear. I think I waited something like uh, a total of 18 months during the entirety of my career to be able to move into the job to which the president had appointed me because of various uh, procedural issues with the United States Senate. But the, and Jerry was very helpful to me in his capacity as a uh, uh, an assistant to uh, Senator Cranston. But more to the point, there's a family connection, which is about 50 years ago, no, 60 <laughs> years ago, uh, my family lived in Long Island, uh, New York. Uh, they had a home out there, and uh, we knew uh, Jerry's grandfather. And uh, his grandfather uh, offered me a job one summer uh, painting 
the cottage on his property or the garage, I'm not sure which, but uh, with, uh, together with uh, Jerry's uncle, uh, Jonathan Warburg. So the, the family tie goes back a long way. My parents were great friends with your grandparents, and so I'll certainly never forget that. Uh, Dean Stam, thank you for hosting me here today. Uh, faculty members uh, and uh, students here at the Frank Batten School of Public Leadership and Public Policy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm delighted to be here. These remarks are going to be somewhat informal. I think I'll talk for 20, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have time uh, for a discussion. I really prefer the, the Q&A aspect of these encounters because it, it enables me to get right to the issues that are on your mind. But uh, uh, we laid out a sort of a rough topic here about uh, global security, uh, the challenges, uh, and the agenda ahead. And I'd just like to talk about two or three different topics under that rubric. And the first, I guess, is if you're thinking about international relations and national security, I suppose uh, major question you've got to ask yourself is what, what kind of global order do we both live in and what kind of global order lies ahead? And I think Dr. Kissinger's book, uh, his most recent uh, publication, which is called World Order, and it's, a, it's not a very long book, but it's a very thoughtful one. And he puzzles with this issue of the fact that uh, uh, never has there been uh, the, the, the phenomenon of China, is really the, the, the issue of dealing with China and what its impact on the global or, order is going to be. And he has some very interesting material in there about a memorandum that was written in 1907 by someone in the Foreign Office. It was called the Crow Memorandum, where uh, Mr. Crow, a, a British uh, diplomat, uh, surmised that there would be inevitable war between uh, Great Britain and Germany because of the rising power uh, of Germany. And so Mr. Kissinger sort of asks the same question with respect to uh, what's going to happen now with the established power being the United States and the rising power being China. And can we manage world affairs, all of us, in such a way as to avoid conflict and make these relationships a positive uh, sum gain? So uh, we have to think about the world order. The great powers, China, Russia, which is trying to be, reassert itself as a great power. How are we going to adjust those relationships uh, in the years ahead? We have this so-called Westphalian system of states, nation states, sovereign nation states, that uh, was created pretty much uh, in the latter part of the 17th century, and which in many respects is still valid today. I mean, it, the basic organizational unit of international relations is still the nation state. We have multilateral mechanisms and so forth and regional organizations, but it's the sovereign nation state that is still the driver here. And actually where we run into serious problems of, uh, of stability in the world are either when a greater power, like maybe Russia, disrespects some of the principles of the Westphalian system, i.e. sovereignty as they're doing uh, in Ukraine today, or the completely opposite case where the state itself has sort of evaporated and you've got ungoverned space uh, being governed by either nobody or criminals or, or Al-Qaeda or what have you. We were responsible for establishing the post-World War II order in the United States. We have, I think, have more responsibility than any other country. Uh, we created the UN. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt learned from the lessons of Woodrow Wilson and created a, helped create a more viable institution, uh, including institutionalizing the veto in the Security Council, which some people object to now, but they forget that it would not have been, the, the UN Charter would not have been ratifiable in the United States Senate had there not been the veto to protect our uh, sovereign interests. We were intimately involved in the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, the financial institutions, many of which still exist to this very day, the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth. And then you've got 
the rising powers I was talking about. You've got Russia, China. Are they challenging this order that we, uh, that we all helped to build uh, in earlier years? What, what about the BRICS, the so-called Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa? Are they trying to create some alternative world order? I mean, why is China proposing to create a development bank, a global development bank? Why are they doing some of the things they're doing? Or is it that they feel that their share of the existing uh, governance of the existing global system uh, is inadequate and they would like to see it increase? Does India, for example, feel underrepresented because it's not a permanent member of the Security Council? Or does China object to the fact that it hasn't got enough shares in the International Monetary Fund? Something, a, a, a concern of China is that we recognize and have actually decided we'd like to see an increase in their quota in the International Monetary Fund, but we um, up until now have not been able to get the Congress uh, to uh, accept it. So I, I think uh, we're in a situation where there's an evolving uh, global order, but based still, I think rooted still in a lot of the mechanisms and concepts uh, that have preceded us and I, but I think how it actually goes in the future is going to depend a lot, a lot, on how we uh, manage our relationships with some of the other major countries in the world, U.S. China, U.S. Russia, uh, and to a, le a lesser extent how we manage uh, relations with some of the other uh, rising uh, powers. Both. I think both President Bush and, to speak of the recent administrations, and President Obama have recognized this. Uh, since when people think about President Bush's foreign policy, they focus so much on Iraq, they, they neglect some of the other areas where he took some very interesting and I think constructive initiatives. And, and one of which was to reach out to some of these emerging powers uh, in a very, very important way. India is perhaps the best example because uh, Bush, uh, advised by uh, his national security advisor and then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, really felt it important to reach out to India and basically establish some kind of strategic relationship with that country. And we really put our money where our mouth was because we, we uh, helped, uh, we negotiated a civilian uh, nuclear agreement, which was not an easy thing to accomplish at the time because India is not a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and things had to be done uh, in order to get the rest of the international community to accept the fact that we would have a nuclear uh, energy cooperation agreement with India. China was another area where uh, both administrations, I think, have invested considerable effort in developing the uh, bilateral relationship following a tradition that really goes all the way back to the Nixon administration. I think American presidents have probably been, when you think about it, more consistent in their treatment of, of uh, the US-China relationship than many people realize. I think we've always uh, invested a lot in it. We've always sought to make it a positive sum game rather than some sort of zero uh, sum game. And uh, uh, American presidents have personally devoted a lot of their uh, uh, diplomatic effort to the relationship with China. At the moment, the state-to-state -state relationship that is really problematic, of course, is the relationship with Russia. And what do we do? And what is happening? And this is a very, very difficult question indeed. I think part of it has to do with the real oscillations in Russia's own behavior and also the course of its economic fortunes during the past uh, 25, 30 years or so, because after the end of the Cold War and with the demise of the Soviet Empire and the independence of the, uh, uh, the republics, um, Russia was uh, really prostrate economically. They were, their economy was compared to something on the order of the same GDP as the Netherlands or something like that, a country with a tenth the population uh, of Russia. And they felt that very humiliated by that experience. And they felt also, a lot of them will say, or, and did say then, that, that they felt that we were treating them like, like a defeated power. And certainly in the times of the Soviet Union, and I think again today, 
the Russians have placed uh, a great deal of value on uh, being treated as a peer by us, even if the basic underlying uh, economic and political facts uh, don't necessarily justify it. So when you see the advent of a leader by, uh, like Vladimir Putin, who has the most m mysterious and kind of uh, interesting ascent to power, I mean, he basically comes out of nowhere, right? He's a KGB agent in East Germany uh, in 1990, and he's president of Russia in the year 2000. Now, wait a minute, you know, that's pretty cool. How do you do that? How do you... And he wasn't even the head of the KGB. He was an agent in a country. He was the station chief uh, in East Germany. So it was quite a series of circumstances, coincid coincidences, twists and turns that propelled him into that position. But, but he clearly, if nothing else, I mean, there are many things you can say about Mr. Putin. And in fact, people spend a lot of time studying his personality because it's, uh, I think people find it difficult to fathom. But if nothing else, he's a nationalist. I think that's absolutely certain. And uh, secondly, I think it is his goal to restore uh, Russia to something resembling the status that he remembers that it had when he was a KGB agent, or prior to the time he was a KGB agent, to maybe to the time when his bosses had been running the KGB in the years before. And I think that's sort of what, what drives Vladimir Putin. And he's maneuvered himself into a sufficiently authoritarian position that uh, it, it would appear that he is the individual who really decides the course of, uh, of Russian foreign policy. So that's what we have to deal with it. It's a fact. You could lament it, you could deplore it, you could think what you wish of it, but it's the reality that we have to confront um, as a country, uh, as a member of uh, the, as a leader of the NATO countries, as a Western country, and so forth. And so it's led to some interesting outcomes. In 2008, I think, was somewhat of a, of a turning point. In 2008, in the spring, there was a NATO meeting where the NATO countries announced that uh, they were going to invite uh, Russia and Georgia to United Nations membership. That was in April, I think. It was a meeting in Bucharest, if I'm not mistaken, or Lisbon. I forget which of the two. And three, four months later, uh, there's warfare breaks out in the country of Georgia and the Russians. Uh, basically consolidate their influence and control over a couple of these enclaves uh, in Georgia, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And I, I always thought in the back of my mind that while there may have been other proximate causes to that conflict, that one of the underlying ones might have been Mr. Putin wanting to shoot across our bow, a, a message across our bow saying, uh-uh, no, no NATO. Uh, don't touch that. And, uh, and I think his behavior towards the Ukraine uh, is something of a similar order, although now it's become, uh, well, it's a larger country, it's a bigger situation, and it, I think um, it's been uh, even more uh, aggressive. But he definitely uh, is obviously saying we don't want we don't want the Ukraine to be aligned uh, with the West. We don't want it to be part of NATO. And oh, by the way, we even want to hold on to a part of it that we think Nikita Khrushchev uh, unjustifiably returned to Ukraine, uh, namely uh, the Crimea. So how, where is this going to go? And how are we going to deal with it? Well, carefully, first of all, I'd say, uh, because you got to remember this is their they're near abroad. I don't want to justify what the Russians have done, but I also want to recognize the reality that these things are happening right on their border where they have an easier time creating facts on the ground than we do. Uh, but secondly, firmly and with support for the sovereignty of the country of the Ukraine. I personally would give weapons, uh, lethal weapons to uh, the Ukrainians, uh, a lot of people who don't want to, and we'll find out 
whether Mr. Obama plans to in the near future because he's saying, or people are saying, that we'll learn that in the wake of the meetings that uh, they're having uh, today, I believe, Angela Merkel and the Russians and the Ukrainians and, and the French. But uh, I would give them the wherewithal to defend themselves better so that they could raise the cost and it, 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 there'd be a deterrent value uh, to uh, uh, Russian behavior and make it more costly for them uh, to be carrying out the kind of activities they're carrying out in the Ukraine at the moment. It's obviously not going to solve the situation in and of itself, uh, but it, it is, it's a legitimate request on the part of the Ukraine. They're a free country, supposedly, and have the right to, uh, uh, to ask for, for outside help. We'll see how all of this uh, plays itself out. It's obviously at this particular point in time the most important state-to-state -state issue on the president's plate, if you will, on the president's agenda. Uh, let's talk briefly. Uh, there isn't time uh, to, to do all of this, but let's talk briefly about non-state actors because that's the other uh, sort of part of the equation, if you will, in the international picture, and I have a certain amount of personal experience, both as director of national intelligence in assessing those kinds of uh, issues and practical experience uh, in terms of having served in Iraq uh, for eight months as United States ambassador there back in 2004-2005. Al-Qaeda, and, and the president said a few a couple of three years ago, I think, that Al-Qaeda was uh, in retreat and it was sort of uh, on its heels. And, and there's no question that they uh, suffered some severe blows uh, in uh, Iraq. And I think that that situation was under reasonably uh, good uh, control. But then, lo and behold, the situation in Syria erupts with uh, problems they've had there in the wake of the Arab Spring and the the, uh, the revolt against uh, Bashar al-Assad, and uh, this group called ISIL, which is really ISIS, is, it's an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. It may be uh, now a, a real, I, I don't know whether you'd call it a son of Al-Qaeda or a nephew of Al-Qaeda, but it's definitely got some of the same roots, I think some of the same people uh, fighting in it, but it has developed extraordinary strength. And I think it's developed it in part because of the ongoing war in Syria, which has given them an opportunity to build themselves up. And then to our surprise, about, what, almost a year ago, eight or, eight or nine months ago, they started showing amazing strength in Iraq. They overtook Mosul, and then they started coming down the road towards, uh, through the, the Sunni Triangle. And they were, I, I was getting questions from the media, well, when are they going to capture Baghdad? And I said, come on, they're not going to capture Baghdad. Baghdad, they're going to get pushed back, and eventually people will organize themselves to defeat or to push ISIS out of the country. And I think that's what you're seeing unfold at the moment. They've had setbacks. They're no longer fighting so brazenly and blatantly as they did before with, you know, running little armored cars and stuff up and down the roads. They've got to go more into a sort of a, a covert uh, mode, and they're still strong, but I think the uh, the Iraqi forces are getting back on their feet. And to my surprise, and I would say pleasant surprise, President Obama, I think between the fast, uh, the speed with which ISIS was able to accomplish what it did, and then some of these gruesome executions, I think spurred President Obama to send American forces back into Iraq. Let's, that's a big decision for President Obama. You know you would have not predicted you know in your heart that he, that's something he must have not wanted to do. And he must have, if you'd asked him in 2009, after U.S. forces have withdrawn from Iraq, will you ever send them back? I bet you his answer to the question before ISIS would have been no. So even President Obama, for whom this is probably not the happiest decision of his life, saw the necessity uh, to do this. So we're responding to that uh, situation there, and I think eventually uh, it will be brought under control. Uh, Al-Qaeda still functions in other parts of the world. We all know that. It's uh, in, the, in the Maghreb, uh, it's in the uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula, and there's even core Al-Qaeda, Mr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, who's hidden up there somewhere in the Afghan 
Pakistan border area. I don't know how many people he's got, but he's got enough people and enough, uh, he's well enough uh, sheltered that he's able to issue his various orders and, uh, and uh, videotapes and messages uh, every now and then. But this is a, a situation that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Eventually, we're going to have to come to grips with the question of Syria and what to do about it because there's an inherent conflict in our policy towards Syria, an inherent contradiction, namely to, that we're against ISIL and we want to fight against them. And we even occasionally take, uh, uh, target them in Syria. And at the same time, we're opposed to the Bashar uh, al-Assad regime, which itself is opposed, uh, which is being opposed by ISIL also. So there's sort of a, a, a conflict of, uh, of interest there that it, over time we're going to have to reconcile. My own view is that first of all, no matter what we do, we have to stabilize Iraq more before we can devote more energy and resources to what to do about the Syria problem. And then by that time, maybe we'll have sorted out our own minds as to exactly how to go forward. At least that's, if I were in government, that's what I would be advising the president at this particular uh, point in time. Um, last but not least is uh, uh, the issue of s the stability in the Middle East uh, generally uh, and in South Asia. We've talked already about a bit about Syria and uh, Iraq. To me, the big uh, single country in the region uh, that we need to uh, focus on uh, carefully is Egypt, what can be done to stabilize Egypt, to restore it to uh, uh, economic and political health. But first of all, they've got to establish security. And then in my view, they need help in rebuilding their economy. It, it really took a huge uh, beating as a result of the events of 2011. Tourism, which is a major uh, revenue earner for the Egyptians fell by 80 or 90 percent. And now it, it, it's bottomed out and it's starting to go back up again. But, uh, but Egypt needs uh, a lot of help in, in all uh, shapes and forms. And I think we do well to align ourselves uh, in strong support of the government and the people of Egypt. And I think uh, we've also been successful in encouraging, and, and the Egyptians have been successful in encouraging some of the other wealthy Arab nations uh, to come to their assistance uh, as well. Uh, Afghanistan is sort of an ongoing situation. We'll have to see how that plays itself out. Pakistan, uh, I dealt, I handled the, uh, I always got the really interesting portfolios when I was Deputy Secretary of State. Nobody else in the department really at my level wanted to handle Pakistan, so I got to go out there uh, several times a year is a, a really interesting situation, but very difficult and very dangerous because you, it's a country with nuclear weapons uh, and it's not uh, ceasing to build them. They, they continue to develop their nuclear weapons capability. And they've got this uh, divided society where it's the military who run the entire uh, national security apparatus. Anything that has to do with uh, sensitive diplomacy, national security, all of those issues basically is handled by uh, the Pakistani army uh, and the Pakistani uh, intelligence uh, service. And if you, if you want to think of a division of labor, perhaps it's some of the economic and, and those kinds of issues that are really handled uh, by the civilian side. And it's, it's really a, a, a a situation that has existed for years and years and years and years. Uh, Pakistan's history, really since its inception, has been one of a very, very strong role for the military. I remember when I went to Mumbai, uh, or not to Mumbai, to, to Delhi in 2008, just after the attacks on Mumbai by the terrorists, and I went and saw the uh, number two person, my counterpart in the Indian Foreign Ministry, he said, well, you know, what happened was that partition uh, they got the army, in Pakistan that is, uh, they got the army and we got the civil service, which is a kind of a shorthand way of explaining why those two countries are so different uh, in terms of the, the way they handle civil uh, military 
relationships. So Pakistan is another issue that just is going to require um, continuous and constant uh, surveillance, attention, analysis, study, so forth. Um, last but not least, I just want to mention, because we shouldn't, you know, one of the dangers of uh, talking about security issues and intelligence and threats, um, you got to remember that for many other people, in including ourselves, uh, there are a lot of other issues in our lives besides uh, threats and security and all that stuff. You've got to have that. It's important. But we shouldn't, and particularly when it comes to diplomacy and statecraft, we mustn't forget the economic component. And uh, there are a lot of good things, hap good things happening in the world at the moment on the economic front. And I would just signal these two initiatives to uh, negotiate a trans-Pacific partnership in the Asia-Pacific region and a TTIP, which is trade and, well, I can't remember, Treaty for Trade and Investment uh, with Europe, with the European countries, basically with the European uh, Union. And uh, President Obama in the State of the Union mes message uh, asked for a trade promotion authority for the Congress, which is the authority you need in order to be able to uh, get a trade agreement through the Congress uh, without amendment. Uh, that Congress hasn't acted on that request yet. I'm not sure a formal request has been made, but the President said he would ask for it. I take encouragement from that. Trade is a huge uh, multiplier, uh, force multiplier uh, in the international economic scene. It's of immeasurable help to us. It's been of extraordinary assistance to a country like Mexico with whom we did a free trade agreement some 25, uh, 20 years ago. Where, uh, where the levels of trade now between us and Mexico are about four or five times uh, what they were back then. So this is a very positive thing. And so as we focus on international security issues, uh, let's not forget that there's some other very important and uh, uh, also positive uh, dimensions. I, uh, I think... I'll leave it at that, except to say there's a lot of room for diplomacy in here, a lot. Uh, it's not as if diplomacy is dead or that there's no use, you know. I used to get the question, well, aren't you just a messenger boy for the president? I mean, what do you do anymore? And I, uh, a lot. You can do a lot. And there's a lot of opportunities out there, both in terms of... Uh, of reporting and analysis on the situations that are going on out there, and then um, on uh, helping devise constructive solutions to the issues that arise uh, between uh, our country and others, or for those of you who are from another country, but between your country and others. So uh, diplomacy is alive and well. And in fact, I don't think there's ever been such a plethora of activities taking place between countries. So uh, there's a lot of food there. Uh, I know that many of you have uh, got public service careers uh, in mind when you graduate. I think that's wonderful. Uh, personally, even though I've been in the White House and the NSC and I've been in the DNI, I'll put in a plug for the Foreign Service, <laughs> uh, which is what I did for most of my career. and. Uh, I find the, the website of the State Department pretty user-friendly uh, when it comes to uh, you know, looking for job opportunities there. I'm sure you've all found that already with State and the other agencies. But uh, I'm delighted to know that such a high proportion of you want to do public service. I think that's a very good and, frankly, an extremely encouraging thing. Thank you. Well, Ambassador Negroponte, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, one of the advantages of having somebody that can speak so authoritatively across so many different issues is that it gives rise to an enormous number of questions. So I'm going to ask, well, I'm going to sort of exercise the dean's prerogative and ask the first question and then turn it over to the floor. One of the places that you talked about 
is, or mentioned was Syria. And Syria is a place that poses a particular challenge for the United States and I think for diplomats and diplomacy because two core principles for US foreign policy are in tension with one another. If we want to support democracy and Democrats, we should be opposing the Assad regime. If we want to contain ISIS and combat that, it would seem like our best available partner there might be the Assad regime. Are there sets of principles that we can look to in these kinds of situations where a core interest in supporting the extension of democracy and liberalism is in tension with more clearly defined immediate security interests? How do we balance these? Well, I guess first of all, the answer is with, with some difficulty. The second is, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to, to state that that's an issue and a, and a question that arises. And different people have different views as to how to deal with these situations. I'm not sure there's any, if you try to establish it as a, a, an inviolable principle of some kind, you'd probably come up against your first exception, the first case you handled. Um, so I think one has to be pragmatic about it. But, but let me suggest a couple, of, maybe an example that it may be a bit extreme, but I think it makes the case in a way Franklin Roosevelt chose to align the United States with the Soviet Union in World War II. And he was under no illusion uh, that the Soviet Union was a democratic uh, state. But he did it because of the overwhelming imperative of defeating Adolf Hitler. So, you know, you've got that example over on that side. The the cases very often are much less clear cut yeah. than that. And so then you end up with judgmental issues. And uh, I think where you can, the American decision maker, the American president, the American policy maker will, will always try to promote the democratic uh, principle where they can. But they do at times have to recognize that uh, Maybe you have to make a choice between the lesser of two evils. It's something we hate to do. And as it, I mean, I think our DNA doesn't really like making choices between the lesser of evils. We don't like admitting that that's what we've done. Uh, maybe that's the issue. So, frankly, I, I'm not sure that we have that much clarity yet on exactly how we're going to ultimately handle Syria. But I think you raise a, a, a question that is, I think it's always on people's minds. And I think that even though uh, our record is mixed as a whole, uh, we've been a force for good in the world. And I mean, our record is mixed with respect to democracy, but I think we've been a force for good in the world. And I think we've been in the forefront of encouraging democratic trends. And I would cite you as an example the continent of, well, S South and Central America where, uh, you know, when I entered the Foreign Service, there were an awful lot of people wearing uniforms running those mm -hmm. countries, uh, and there are far fewer uh, doing that today. And I, part of that has been as a result of a conscious policy by the United States. Yeah, I think we'd have to actually look at the, the transitions that took place, particularly in Central American countries, mm -hmm. over the past 20 years is one of the great success stories mm -hmm. of U.S. foreign policy that people either unaware of or blissfully choose to ignore as critics of some administrations. So questions from our students. If you could uh, stand up and identify yourself and then pose your question. And both of these crises have revealed some of the weaknesses of these West African states. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on the security of that region of the world. Thank you. Well, first, my, my thoughts on security in, in West Africa. They face, I think particularly Nigeria, 
faces uh, an extraordinary challenge at the moment. This so-called Boko Haram group has been carrying out more and more egregious uh, acts of violence uh, and terror. I happen to be fortunate enough to co-teach at Yale. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's also on the faculty there uh, at the moment. We don't teach a course together, but with Johnny Carson, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa in the first Obama administration. I, I asked him about yesterday, even, day before yesterday, Boko Haram, do they have ties with Al-Qaeda? Because that is a question that always, you know, I'm curious about to what extent is this externally influenced. And Johnny doesn't think so. He really doesn't think so. Uh, they may have some occasional contact with Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, but that this is basically a homegrown thing. What's really disappointing is the uh, uh, Nigerian military's response. They've not been effective, um, and they've also had some difficulty cooperating with the United States, accepting our assistance, allowing certain kinds of trainers to uh, have access to their military. It's been a, a fraught kind of uh, Relation, which is a pity because it's a country with whom we have considerable sympathy and uh, quite a bit of friendship. Good luck, Jonathan's been to the States. There's a pretty large Nigerian community in the United States. So Nigeria is a problem area at the moment. And, and what's more, as you know, they're going through this election and they've gone and postponed the election by six weeks uh, because uh, I think they, the argument is that they don't feel they could secure the election at this particular point in time. So. I think all eyes are on Nigeria. Part, parts of the rest of West Africa strike me, certainly in comparison, as being in pretty good shape, whether you're talking about Ghana or Senegal or, or some of the others. Uh, it, they're in relatively uh, uh, good, good condition. But it, your question goes to the issue of governance, and governance is a problem all over the world, the quality of governance. And if you have bad governance, it's going to show up in various ways, either through uh, inadequate civil programs in the government or a, uh, inefficient and ineffective military or police force. And uh, so governance is really a primary objective in uh, helping these countries uh, be better off. Hello, my name is uh, Robbie Biggs. I'm the first year postgrad here at the Batten School. Uh, you referenced a few minutes ago that there's a plethora of diplomacy still going on in the world. What role do you see the State Department taking as possibly a leader in policy making instead of policy following going forward? Uh, this is sort of a process question. And uh, it, I mean, the national security system, which was set up in 1947, right, with the, uh, the 1947 Act, sort of lays the, the basic outline, which hasn't really changed that much over the years. What has changed and what fluctuates, actually, are the respective roles of the different players and institutions, whether it's uh, the National Security Advisor or the Defense Department or uh, the State Department, but always within a certain set of limits. I think there are periods where the NSC was very small and focused and basically was contented to sort of give guidance uh, at, a, at a sort of general level, but not get too involved in uh, detailed management of policies. Uh, there have been other t uh, um, times when they've taken a sort of a very possessive approach over, over the whole process. On, when I worked for Dr. Kissinger on the NSC in, from 1970 to 73, we had 50 or 60 people on the NSC staff. Today, there's something like 1,400. So it's become a bit more of a, it's, it, it's, it's imposed itself more on the process throughout the government. That said, and this, I always make this point to my students, I think the three most important people in Washington, from the point of view of national security, after the president himself, are without doubt the national security advisor, the secretary of defense, and the secretary of state. And usually when they get along, uh, there's uh, a minimum 
of problems in the whole policy process. When they have differences, uh, watch out. One of the things that was instructive to me when I was Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, Mr. Weinberger uh, ha had resigned as Secretary of Defense and, and Frank Carlucci took over from him. Mr. Schultz was Secretary of State and Colin Powell was the National Security Advisor. And the first thing he did when he became National Security Advisor would a, was uh, to have a meeting with the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense in his office every morning at 7 o'clock even if it was only for 10 or 15 minutes to talk about the order of the day and what the problems were out there that we'd have to deal with during that day. Because his predecessor, uh, in the predecessor situation, when Mr. Weinberger was still Secretary of Defense, he and Mr. Schultz, even though they'd worked in the same uh, company, engineering company in uh, California, the Bechtel Corporation, we're not on speaking terms at the end of the Reagan administration. You can't run a national security policy if key players uh, are you know, on bad terms with each other. Now you, we've seen that arise from time to time, and it's very, it's not positive. Can I just follow it, Ambassador? Yeah. Can I follow up on that a little bit? So that advice there goes contra a little bit, sort of the claim or the argument that Doris Keenan makes in her book, Team of Rivals, mm -hmm. where her argument is that basically some of the most effective cabinets have been one where presidents have assembled very comp people with very competitive viewpoints and differing viewpoints. I think that the argument you make is compelling, but how do we balance this need to have all sides of an issue presented to the president with, at the same time, organizations that need to be able to work together actually pulling on the same war? Right, and it's a sort of a balancing act. and, and <clears throat> I, I, and I think maybe you could look at it from a point of view of operations on the one hand and policy on the other. If, if the president says, I want to know what you all think I should do about problem X, I think everybody should feel free to give their point of view even if they're utterly divergent. But I think the, the issue very often is even when the policy has been decided, if you then get differences in the area of implementation, I think that there's something wrong there, and that's where I think the National Security Advisor has got to knock some heads. But it really helps if you've got a modicum of consensus between the, the top three or four players in the NSC apparatus. The best NSC and the best sort of uh, foreign policy and national security machine, in my recollection, was uh, George, under George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, and it ran extremely well, and I think it's because these people all got along. They were very mature, they were very experienced, and also, frankly, um, uh, they had modest egos. Yeah. Uh, I think that also helps. In the back, center. I think we have time for about one more question. I know some of you will have to get ready for class in just a couple of moments. My name is Jay, I'm a third year student in the college, and I was wondering if Russia continues its aggressive actions, do you think its position on the UN, but more importantly, the UN Security Council could be in danger? Um, it's hard, first of all, in your first part, about what, you know, what if. Uh, I think that's one of the big analytic issues at the moment. What, how far is Mr. Putin prepared to go? I'm sure that's a question that is analyzed with great frequency uh, in the intelligence community. How do, what, how do we assess his motives? What's driving him? And there's been some pretty good, good books written on that. Fiona Hill and another author together wrote a book about uh, the many faces of Mr. Putin. She's with the uh, Brookings Institution and used to be the national intelligence officer for uh, Russia uh, in the Bush administration. So what? What drives this man? What, what are his intentions? But um, no matter what they do, uh, I don't see any circumstance under which their seat uh, in the Security Council can be in danger because to, to oust them, you'd have to change the charter. And they, the Russians, as one of the five permanent members, has a veto. Uh, over the only way you could do it is amend the charter and the only way you can amend the charter is by decision of the Security Council to make such a recommendation so they've got blocking power 
we have to accept them. That part of the price of entry for us and having a veto in 1945 was that, well, we had to concede it to several other countries as well. So we live uh, with that fact. Um, you know, we didn't talk about leadership. And uh, I know that, that I'd been asked to address it somewhat, and I think I got so tied up in my geopolitical discussion that I... But I wanted to mention this book, Supreme Command, which maybe that's one of your uh, books that you read uh, by Elliot Cohen. What I thought was interesting about Elliot Cohen's book is called Supreme Command, Soldiers, Statesmen, and Leadership in Wartime. And it studies the examples of, uh, of Lincoln, of Winston Churchill, uh, of Clemenceau of France, and of Van Gurion. And uh, one of the interesting conclusions and observations he makes, which is, I think, for some at least, counterintuitive, is that a longer a war goes on and the more serious these situations are, the more involved the head of state or the head of government has to get involved in them. It, you can't, it's very difficult to remain aloof from what's going on because it turns out that the kinds of decisions that have to be made re really require all the attributes of being head of government or, or head of state. And I, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Lincoln, but it's, an, it's a wonderful study uh, of, uh, of his role as a, as a strategist. And uh, he's a great study. And, and I guess if I had just one thought on the subject of uh, leadership and uh, how to learn about it, I guess I would say read, and particularly read biography. I think that uh, biography is fascinating, and uh, there is no perfect model. There is no right answer, but at least by uh, studying how others have handled difficult situations in the past, one can at least have the benefit of uh, what they did uh, when you yourself uh, might come confront some such uh, situation in the future. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. We really appreciate it. Thank you.